Welcome back you guys and let's talk about some role players taking the next step in their development which are making them more reliable pieces in their team's rotation. There are some players not in this video that you may think should be in here but I wanted to highlight these 7 players that are growing into their specific roles that are needed on their current team. These players in this video are breaking out in different ways so you're going to see some veteran players and some players that are still on their rookie contract. If you want to see these role players in person or any other NBA player, the best way to do it is through the SeatGeek app who I want to thank for sponsoring this video. Instead of having to search everywhere on the web for the best ticket prices, SeatGeek does all the work for you by putting every single ticket from that event into one spot for you to pick from. They then give those tickets a grade out of 100, so if it's green then you know it's good, if it's red then you know it's bad. If you're still not sure about the seat you pick, they have a feature that lets you see what you're getting before you buy. By supporting SeatGeek, you're also supporting me, so if you're thinking about going to a game or a concert this fall or winter, you can get $20 off your first ticket purchase by using my promo code KANE when you check out. First on the list is Pascal Siakam of the Toronto Raptors. He was mainly a backup big on the Raptors last season, but this year he is now their starting power forward and has broken out as a scorer, passer, and defender. It's actually crazy how much energy he plays with on offense and defense. Once he grabs a defensive rebound, he can push the ball and get a dunk or make a pass that leads to a bucket. The scary thing about Pascal is, you can tell he's still not fully developed as a passer yet on fast breaks. Sometimes he gets out of control, but he has made a lot of positive plays from just forcing the defense to run with him. Another thing I like about Pascal is he's really smart with the shots he takes and it's why he's top 5 in field goal percentage this year. If he doesn't have a good shot, he passes it out or looks to create something else. One of his go-to moves is a spin move after one quick dribble, which he uses to get to the rim for an easy layup. Once he gets that shoulder past you, you can start getting ready for the next possession because he's extending past you for a bucket. Now, he's not a reliable shooter yet at this stage of his career, but he changed the way he sets his feet, so he has a more natural full body motion. If he gets an average jump shot sometime in his career and combines that with his natural instincts, he can grow into a borderline all-star maybe. I don't know, that might be too high of expectations, but he already does a bunch of things well that only like two other power forwards in the league can do. Second on the list we have Josh Richardson who is the first of two players in this video that have taken the leap from role player to pretty good starter. Now Josh kind of broke out last year but it wasn't like what he is doing now. As the Heat's leading shot taker, he's making and taking more threes than he ever has in his career. He's bumped up his points per game from 12 to 20 just from last season. What I like about Josh is you can play him off and on the ball, which is a big skill in the NBA today with so many guys that love to dribble. Even with a higher usage percentage this year, he's been more efficient shooting the ball. He's even turning the ball over slightly less than he did last year. Josh isn't some great passer or anything, but you can trust him as a secondary playmaker if Goran Dragic or whoever he's playing next to isn't creating any separation. Not to mention he's a borderline All-NBA defender. I thought he should have been on there last year, but that's for another conversation. Josh's value is increasing as a player every year, which is why you hear him in most of the trade rumors involving the Heat. Miami is one of those teams in the middle of the pack that can't do anything because they're capped out, so trading Josh is their best option of doing anything at the moment. Moving on to the third player on the list, Brooke Lopez. Here's a crazy stat. As of today, Brooke Lopez has more three-pointers made than Klay Thompson. Brooke has made 45 threes to Klay's 44 so far, and Brooke has taken less attempts. Brooke is shooting 42% from three and has the most threes made for a center this year in just 26 minutes per game. The Milwaukee Bucks are top three in three-point attempts, and a lot of that has to do with Brooke just launching threes to open up space for Giannis, Bledsoe, and Middleton. Lopez just had a game against Denver where he made eight three-point shots, and a few of them were from Ryan Anderson range. Now, Brooke is obviously an NBA veteran and has averaged 20 points per game in Brooklyn, but he is breaking out in a way he has never had in his career. 75% of his shot attempts have came at the three-point line. Brooke has never taken that high of a percentage of shots at the three-point line in his career. Yes, he shot threes in Brooklyn and LA, but never at this type of rate. He was still in the post a decent amount, but you rarely see him taking those post shots this year. He is a full-time stretch five in Mike Budenholzer's offensive system and must be guarded. In Montrez Harrell's last five games, he is averaging 20 points, 8 rebounds, and shooting 73% from the field. 
Now, Harrell hasn't been the best player on the Clippers, but he might be the most consistent and most relentless. He's only shooting 68% from the line, but he's getting to the free throw line more. He's getting to the free throw line five times a game this year, which is almost double what he shot last year. The two-man pick and roll game with Lou Williams has led to a lot of dunks and easy finishes. He doesn't do it often, but he can post up a little bit. He doesn't provide floor spacing for the Clippers, but his at-the-rim efficiency is what makes him a useful offensive player at the five. He's shooting 67% from the field overall, which is third in the NBA. Moving to the defensive side of the floor, he has almost doubled his block rate. Harrell only stands at about 6'8", and compared to other centers, that's small, but he has a 7'4 wingspan, so he makes up for it. He broke out a bit last year, but it seems like he's putting it all together this year on this Clippers team without a quote-unquote star. I would say as of today, he's in that group of seven players I would have on the sixth man of the year ballot. Moving on to another role player that has been really efficient this year, and that is DeMontis Sabonis of the Pacers. In his first year in Indiana, he shot 51% from the field, which is solid, but when comparing it to this year, it's nothing. Through the first 13 games, he is shooting 68% from the field. That type of percentage jump in just one year is crazy. It might not stay at 68 the whole year, but you can pretty much trust him to take a smart shot once he gets the ball. He had a game against the Knicks where he shot 12 of 12 from the field. Yeah, it was the Knicks, but at the end of the day, it's not easy making all of your shots, even if most of them are at the rim. At 6'11", 240 pounds, Sabonis has been Indiana's most important player in the front court, and the Pacers need this production at the 4 or 5 because Miles Turner has struggled in certain games this year, and he's not shooting the 3 ball well. Sabonis also has like three really disrespectful poster dunks this year. He had one on Embiid and one against the Bucks. This dude can really elevate. Second to last player we're going to talk about in this video is JaVale McGee of the Lakers. It seems like we're talking about a lot of big men that are shooting super efficient this year in this one. Getting JaVale on a $2.4 million contract might be one of the biggest deals of the offseason. He has been incredible for the Lakers and the biggest reason why their defense is in complete trash. JaVale is top 5 in the NBA in field goal percentage, top 3 in blocks per game, and I believe he is top 5 in total dunks made out of all players. I talked about JaVale in a previous video and about 2 weeks ago he was the Lakers' third leading scorer. They are running a lot of actions with JaVale at the rim and getting him involved like he never has been in his career. Before the Lakers got Tyson Chandler, they were pretty much cooked at the backup center position. The defense collapsed when he was off the court because they had to play people out of position and they did not have that lob threat or last minute person to throw to under the rim. Let me say this again, he's doing all of this while on a 1 year $2.4 million contract. He is clearly outplaying that contract and if he keeps up this level of production, he is guaranteeing himself the biggest deal he will ever get in his life during the 2019 free agency. I really hope JaVale stays healthy throughout this whole year because the Lakers are really thin at the 5 spot. What kind of contract do you think JaVale will be able to get on the open market next summer? I've seen some people say like 3 years, 30 million. Again, he was a huge steal in free agency over the summer and he's going to be big for them all year. Last on the list, we got to talk about Karis LeVert of the Brooklyn Nets. This one is tough because he was breaking out into someone that is not just going to be a role player. He was growing into a player that you can trust to handle the ball and create a shot in tight situations. Karis was leading the Nets in points and steals. Unfortunately, we're going to miss out on a lot of games from him this year because he is out with a right foot injury. The good news is he should be back sometime this year, but it will be at the end of the season when the Nets are probably out of the playoff discussion. Karras bumped up averages in a few of his major stat categories and because of his scoring and defense, the Nets were staying afloat in the early playoff race. At 6'7", he plays really hard on the perimeter and is going to be a part of the future Nets backcourt. This injury is just brutal because you hate to see a guy that was clearly going from a role player to a leader on the court on both ends and now he's going to miss significant time. It's tough to see any player get injured obviously, but it's especially tough when it's someone that was doing so many positive things on the court and developing at a fast pace. Since that era with Darren Williams, Joe Johnson, Paul Pierce, and Kevin Garnett, there hasn't been much to talk about in Brooklyn. But guys like Karis LeVert have made the Nets a lot less boring to watch and more intriguing going forward, especially in this 2019 free agency class where they're going to have a lot of money. And that is it for some role players that are breaking out on their teams. I could have probably talked about Zach Collins of the Blazers, Marcus Morris on the Celtics, and Monty Morris of the Nuggets, but I wanted to focus on these seven players. If you think someone else should have been on here, let me know in the comments. There are a few guys that are definitely stepping up for their teams that are a fifth starter or coming off the bench. 
Next video should be on players that are reviving their career this year, so I'll see you guys then.